We are delighted to bring you this seminar presented by LabRoots. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation titled Complexities of Characterizing Mineral Particle Toxicity at the Pulmonary Interface. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Christopher Weiss, Toxicology Liaison and Senior Advisor, Officer of the Director of National Institutes of Health, National Institutes of Environmental Health Science, and National Toxicology Program. For a complete biography of our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speaker will address those questions following his presentation. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Christopher Weiss. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Welcome, sir. And uh, getting used to being ensconced in our respective uh, isolation areas. Um, I'm here at home, joining from the Washington DC area, and I'm happy to be here. Um, I am gonna go ahead and start my, uh, my presentation, and I expect uh, everyone can see that now, I hope. Uh, I've already had an introduction, but we'll just skip through this slide. This is our facility in North Carolina, actually. I'm stationed in the Washington, D.C. area, but we have a large uh, laboratory in uh, the Research Triangle Park area of North Carolina, and that's a, a view of the facility and another view. Um, we uh, are part of the National Institutes of Health. There are 27 institutes of health. Uh, you may have heard of the National Library of Medicine, um, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. We're, uh, and I, uh, that, that institute is getting lots of uh, attention right now as Dr. Anthony Fauci uh, is the director of that institute and has been advising on the coronavirus issues. Uh, you've, if you've been watching the news, you've probably seen his face. Uh, he works in the same building that I work in, and uh, we're here on the Bethesda campus at, in, uh, at NIH. Uh, what I'd like to do to, with, with you today, for you today, is to give you an overview of uh, uh, an, an incident that is both modern and has been going on for decades. Uh, it's a forensic problem that's quite complex. Uh, there's lots of controversy and disagreement about it right now. Uh, it's really a story of um, corporate uh, greed, really, corporate the. Uh, the interest in uh, businesses making money and putting that those interests sometimes some businesses not all certainly putting those interests uh, ahead of public health. Um, so we're going to overview some of the contemporary debates and controversies, and I invite you to follow those. They're in the news regularly these days. And then I'm going to not address those contemporary issues specifically because I'm a little close a little too closely involved in those, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> but um, I'm gonna, there's, a, there's a, a similar incident that occurred almost 20 years ago now that's strikingly uh, 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 similar to the, the incident that's going on today. And I'd like to share that with you. Uh, and then um, uh, check back in on the status of what's going on today with, with those same controversies. So you may have seen uh, photographs like this in the New York Times. Uh, you, there's an interesting article in Chem Watch just uh, a couple of weeks ago that came out, and Chem Watch uh, has been following this story quite closely in a in a way that's that's technical, forensically technical. Uh, the New York Times is. Um, discussing the story in light of uh, various cosmetic products that we know are causing uh, serious poisonings and, and deaths. Uh, so I'm not, again, I'm not gonna talk in any specific detail about 
that present controversy, but we'll want to walk through walk you through an incident that occurred almost 20 years ago that I was very involved with. Uh, that's very very similar to what's going on now. This is a map of Montana, obviously, uh, and I'm going to talk about an area in the far west northwest corner of Montana, one of the most remote areas in the lower 48 states. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, it's about uh, 100 miles west of Glacier National Park. So if you've ever been to Glacier Park, excuse me, <clears throat> if you've ever been to Glacier Park, uh, you know how remote it is in in that area of our country. Uh, so once again, um, uh, this is. This is the area, the brown on the map here is uh, the panhandle of Idaho. And Libby, Montana is a little town of about 5,000 people, just a few miles south of the Canadian border and a few miles east of the Idaho border. Uh, it's a, a very uh, vibrant but, but small village. Here's a picture of Libby, Montana. It's a beautiful, beautiful area of the country. It's nestled in the Kootenai Valley. That's the Kootenai River that you see coursing through um, Libby, Montana. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a frog in my throat here. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, there's a there's a movie. If you've ever seen a movie, it's a bit of an old movie now called The River Wild, and that movie will give you beautiful views of the Kootenai River in this remote area of our country. Uh, the valley, the Kootenai Valley in Libby, Montana is nestled in between the Cabinet Mount Cabinet Mountains in, in, in almost in midsummer. It's far enough north and they're tall enough to have snow caps all year round. So in November of 1999, I was working to provide scientific support for the federal government, forensic scientific support for major incidents and disasters that occurred in our, in our country. And uh, it, it was a, an exciting and very busy job. And, and in, in November, just a few days before Thanksgiving in 1999, uh, this article came out in the Seattle Post Intelligencer, and what it reported this uh, this uh, reporter, Dr. Er, uh, Andrew Schneider, uh, reported that in this small town of 5,000 people, there were several hundred former miners, wives, and children that had uh, been exposed and either died or been diagnosed with fatal illness in this small town. So we were immediately deployed. Uh, my my science team uh, and an on-scene coordinator were immediately deployed to this area to um, uh, help Washington, D.C. understand what was going on. Uh, and so... Um, uh, this is a this is a, a picture of Libby looking down the main street of Libby. It's I want I want you to notice the inversion, the clouds that are laying low in there. That that's part of what caused the problem that I'm going to describe to you over the next over the next few minutes. Um, so as part as initial part of our investigation, we traveled to an area where we were uh, advised was the source of the problem that was going on in Libby. And it was an abandoned, not an abandoned mine, but a, a mine that had been closed uh, just uh, a couple of years earlier that was about five to six miles outside of outside of Libby, Montana. And this is a picture that I took of that mine on my first visit there. Uh, just uh, uh, probably a, a day before Thanksgiving in 1999. Again, you can see it's quite high in the in the Cabinet Mountains, and uh, it's been somewhat closed, but still lots of evidence of mining. This is a picture of that mine um, uh, when it was fully operational, and the way they mined was a strip strip mining process uh, where they basically used dynamite and large equipment to uh, make these terraces and and tear uh, a particular type of mineral out of the out of the mountain and for scale here there's a i don't know if you can see it on your screen but there's a there's a, a very large piece of mining equipment way in the bottom of that pit uh, it gives you an idea of how how big that 
that hole is. This was an area of the mine that they called the glory hole because it, it produced the type of material that they were, they were looking for in this mine. So this is what, what they were looking for. This is the ore that they were pulling out of the mine. And had I known what I was holding in my hand when I took this photograph, I never, uh, I never would have done it. Uh, this is the material that it turns out was uh, just a deadly uh, exposure material to the, to the people in Libby. Uh, what you're looking at here is, a, is the dark in, in, the, in the ore that I'm holding in my hand is a type of hydrobiotite. Uh, it's, a, it's a silicaceous mineral. The white mineral is a very fibrous type of uh, uh, rock. It's, it breaks into small fibers. And uh, it, it, you know, we, we initially expected that it, it, would, it was asbestos. So what the miners did from uh, about 1960, about 1960, 63, until the mid 90s, was they would strip mine this material out of the out of the the mountain, a mountain called Zonolite Mountain, and they would bring it to this mill also on the mountain. And they would crush it up with ball mills and uh, various means, and they would blow air, hot air through it, uh, through the material to remove that white material from the hydrobiotite that they were really after. So what looks like smoke coming out of this mill is not really smoke, but it's uh, fi the fibrous material that's been crushed away from the rock and is now um, uh, 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 being uh, and the problem that they were having uh, exacerbated by the types of aver inversions that I showed you on the previous slide was that the mine and this picture was taken from where that mill had been it had been torn down by the time we got there in 1999 but uh, this picture was taken from the area where the mill had been down into Libby so you can see that although Libby is about five miles away that material and that dust was making its way into the air shed throughout the Kootenai Valley. This is, uh, this is my friend Les Gramstad. Les passed away about six years ago uh, due to inhalation of the material that, that we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. And here Les has in, in protest uh, and, and begging for help and action has put cross for all his family members, his co-workers, and his neighbors who had died from uh, exposure to, to this material. And Les promised me before he, before he passed away, I got to know not just Les, but many people in this town after, after working there on, on this case for almost two years, every, every single week. Um, uh, Les uh, made me promise that I would share his experience and the experience of others uh, with, with you with anyone that I could find who would listen to him. And so on the next slide, we have a, a short video. It's about three and a half minutes long that I'd like to play to you. And it includes uh, Les's perspective on his experience in Libby, Montana, as well as the experience of several others, one of, one of whom is, was the manager of the mine, who you will see in, in legal deposition during this short clip. So let's go ahead and play that. My first experience there was, what in the hell did I get myself into? I just couldn't believe that the dust and the, uh, the dirt. the construction room because that's where I was told to report and he told me I was going to be a sweeper in a dry mill and I had no idea what he was talking about. But first you go over to the uh, <clears throat> warehouse and get a respirator. I had this respirator on and in about 15 minutes I couldn't breathe. So I pulled this respirator off and it was just pl plugged solid. I thought boy I'm not getting nothing done and if I don't I'm going to get canned. 
So I just pulled the respirator off and let it dangle around my neck here, and I, and I really went to work. And uh, at noon, I went back down to eat lunch, and I, I was just covered with this stuff everywhere. It's, and uh, Tom DeShazer was sitting in there, and he was the foreman of the, of the uh, construction department. And he said, how do you like that dust? And I said, Jesus, that's the worst I ever seen. I, I, can't, I can't imagine anything like it. Like, it's the worst I ever seen. And geez, they all laughed, you know, and slapped her leg and said, ah, it's just a nuisance dust. You'll get used to it. The stuff was in your clothes. It was everywhere. It was so fine. The only way you knew it is you'd pour out a cup of coffee and you look down and you could see it settling in the top of your coffee. But you couldn't see it in the air, but you could see it settling in your coffee. You couldn't get it off in there, really. It just stuck. Uh, same way with the ore, you know, and so I took it home with me, and uh, and I'd walk in the house, you know, the, my oldest daughter and my oldest son, they'd grab me by the legs, you know, because they was happy to see me, and here in Cabo Nerida, you know, and she'd come over, you know, and we'd have a hug, and Christ, I was covered with this stuff, you know, it, it wasn't that I was being sloppy, it was just that I couldn't get it off. Uh, is it correct from, that from 1948 on you knew and the company always knew that there was a serious health problem because of the large amount of dust concentrated there? Well, it was certainly known that in some areas there were large concentrations of dust. And uh, it's certainly common knowledge that uh, too much dust of any kind uh, is, uh, is a, not a healthy situation. Grace was on the school board, Grace was on the hospital board, Grace on the bank, and when you talked about dust control here, or anything about the dust and, and what it was doing harmful to these people here, the first thing that came out of their mouth was, you, you're going to close that mine down and you're going to put all these people out of work? Well, you didn't have very many friends when you started talking like that. So uh, that video had a couple of things I would like to share share with you uh, and po and point out. Um, the, uh, the the workers were obviously talking about occupational exposures that were occurring up on the mine, but there were also tremendously high exposures, lethal exposures throughout the the valley, the Kootenai Valley, and throughout the the village of. Uh, of Libby, Montana, uh, and, and it's, it continues to be a bit of a problem. Uh, what, they, what they were mining, what they were after, as I mentioned, was a type of hydrobiotite. It's a silicaceous mineral that when, uh, that when you mine it, it's, it's flat and, and looks like mica, if you've ever seen mica. And uh, it, it um, uh, if you heat it to about 600 degrees, it pops like popcorn. And so what you see here is this expanded material that is, um, is popcorn-like in nature. Here's another couple of views of it. It was, it was sorted into different sizes and marketed for a wide variety of products, just a tremendously wide variety of products. And I'll show you some of what those were. You may have seen this material in, in um, potting soil. You see the white flakes in the potting soil in the upper left. Uh, it's commonly used to ship um, uh, breakable containers, particularly for laboratory situations. If, you, if you're one of those folks that work in a laboratory and you order solvents, it might come in vermiculite. Uh, so that's, that's what uh, this looks like in uh, packing material. It was also used particularly around the processing facilities. And I'll show you that the material was actually shipped from Libby, Montana throughout the United States to various processing facilities that would expand it by heating it and then market it. It was easier to ship in its, in its uh, unexpanded form. So it was shipped all over the country. Uh, 
And it was used, uh, it, especially it near and around these processing plants as, uh, as garden material, uh, uh, was used for playground material, was used for paving roads, et cetera. Uh, this is a this is a photograph taken from one of those uh, 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 an abandoned processing facility in uh, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. So this the material that these children are playing in is uh, waste material from the uh, expanding and processing of this ore. This map shows areas where the large the larger circles are areas where the material was actually shipped by train from Libby, Montana to processing facilities throughout the United States. The smaller um, the smaller circles are areas where the material was uh, distributed. So they're, they're distributors. Uh, as I said, you can still buy this material in uh, uh, large, uh, um, big box stores, such as, uh, I, won't, I won't name any specifically, but any of the, the large um, uh, garden stores, et cetera, uh, sell this material. There is an effort to uh, keep it cleaner than it, than it was in Libby, but uh, mineralogists will tell you that almost all vermiculite has this type of fiber in it that we'll describe. It was also used... Um, uh, shockingly, to uh, insulate as many as 35 million homes throughout the United States and Canada. So this is what it looks like. You may you may want to peek in your attic and see if you have this type of material in your attic. Uh, if you do, there are some some steps you can take to to um, eliminate your exposure or or re at least reduce your exposure to the material. This is an individual in Colorado Springs, Colorado, who uh, is now deceased, but he and his son had uh, insulated their attic with this material in, uh, in one summer in Colorado. That was the only exposure that they had was uh, just the insulation of their attic at one time, and uh, both, both of those individuals had passed away from lung disease. Uh, the material was also used uh, to make popcorn ceilings. You see in the left the two panels on the left that uh, uh, this material was used both um, as an insulation and as an artful kind of decoration in this large atrium you see at the, at the lower left lower left panel. During, during our investigation, of course, we were looking into various records and, and paperwork that that the company had uh, as part of our as part of the case we were building, and we were um, we, we learned during that time uh, again this was probably about 2000 um, we learned that uh, uh, the World Trade Center had been insulated using this material as a fireproofing on the lower parts of both 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 of the buildings, and of course during our investigation. Uh, the World Trade Center was hit with uh, uh, the terrorist attack, and both of the towers collapsed. Uh, this was horrific to us because we we knew that not only was there a tremendous amount of other materials in those buildings, but they were also um, lined with uh, this uh, insulation material that would have been spread throughout uh, the, the the lower Manhattan area. So again, what you know, what is this stuff? What we knew that we had been told by the industry, by WR Grace and WR Grace scientists and their contractors, that this material was not asbestos, that there was no asbestos, that the mine had been closed and there was no no risk any longer because there was no um, uh, there was no no ongoing exposure. We. Um, wanted to look into that much more deeply. And we initiated uh, a, a, a large investigation that included uh, you know, both records investigation, exposure monitoring throughout this, the town, uh, and um, uh, you know, an effort to characterize this material. The problem that we were having is that we knew <clears throat> that uh, regulated asbestos is, is only a very, very small part of the mineral fibers of elongate mineral particles that cause exposure. And we, we suspected certainly that this was the case in Libby. Uh, we were told that the material on the mine was not 
uh, a type of regulated asbestos. And here are the six types of regulated asbestos. asbestos. This is still true today. Uh, the chrysotile, there are two types, two main types, a serpentine or snake-like asbestos called chrysotile. This is about, makes up more than 90% of the asbestos that was used in most products uh, throughout our country. And um, uh, there's an amphibole type of asbestos. This is made up of many different forms of minerals. And uh, I have, uh, there's five of them listed here. These are the only five that are regulated and we we were we suspected that some of these materials the actinolite tremolite might be present in libby but we had to had to prove that forensically so we initiated a major uh, analytical and exposure science based investigation in libby montana that proceeded under emergency response uh, authorities of the federal government for the next two years from 99 on on into 2021 <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we started by figuring, uh, trying to determine the best way to trap this material. We used asbestos cowls and looked very carefully at the difference between cellulose fiber and nucleopore uh, material as a, as a means to, to trap the, the uh, fibers that, that were in the air. <clears throat> and we used, uh, we had uh, more than a dozen electron microscope laboratories on uh, on contract in order to help us measure every aspect of the environment in Libby. So um, what what this uh, series of uh, micrographs show is <clears throat> the uh, the this the flake in the upper left hand panel is a, a flake of this hydrobiotype. And if you look at it at low magnification, so that upper left-hand panel is just a 12 times magnification uh, through a, like a binocular microscope, uh, you don't see much. You don't see a whole lot of fiber. Uh, if you move then um, in the direction of the arrow down to the lower left panel, you begin to see small particulates. And what we're doing here is just zooming in on that same flake of hydrobiotite. And then, um, uh, uh, so you, you begin to see little particulates. If you go to a scanning electron microscope at 2000 times magnification, you begin to clearly see these thin needle-like structures that are the elongate mineral particles that we were interested in. And then if you go to 10,000 magnification in the lower right, you, you see that these things are, um, are, are mineral and they're uh, uh, very long and thin. We use the electron uh, microscope. This is uh, Jeannie Orr in her laboratory in Denver, uh, one of the laboratories that we had under contract. Electron microscopes, most electron microscopes have the ability to uh, shine a one micron um, beam of high energy gamma radiation at a particle in the view scope. And in doing so, you get a spectrum like this because the gamma uh, radiation excites the inner shell electrons in the material you're, you're bombarding with that, that gamma beam. And when those electrons relax, they give off a signal. The frequency of the signal along the x-axis is an indication of the atom that you're looking at. And the magnitude along the, uh, along the y-axis is a measure of how much of that of those atoms are present. So by doing so, you can identify fingerprints of the minerals that are, are uh, that you're looking at under the microscope. So you just target that beam at a particular mineral and, and take a look at it. So we did that for thousands, tens of thousands of samples uh, in Libby. Uh, they're still making such measurements in Libby today, 20 years later. But um, we, we did it often enough to get a statistical idea of the type of minerals we were looking at. And sure enough, the min mineral that most of the minerals that we were looking at were not, were not um, uh, among the regulated asbestos minerals. So you see across the top, Edenite and Richterite going down into the blue panel, Winchite and uh, Magnesio Arvedzinite. 
none of these minerals were part of the regulated material. And we were, we were concerned that we would not be able to regulate this material at all using the existing laws on the, on the books. So, um, let's see here. Uh, but what we did see is down in the lower left that there was the presence, although not much, of uh, tremolite and actinolite. So we turned to to that. Um, we turned to using that information to uh, begin uh, uh, regulating and zoning in on charges that that we thought might be brought against uh, WR Grace. And this slide shows uh, a bundle of these fibers. We saw this often in the samples that we were collecting. This is a bundle of those fibers, and you can see that uh, it, they're 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 clearly associated with each other. But stepping on them, grinding them, uh, releasing them would certainly cause a. a uh, these fibers to be spread out and move into the environment. At the same time we were doing this, uh, the industry uh, funded several researchers to argue the opposite uh, position, that these materials were not asbestos at all. They, were, they did not have characteristics of asbestos. They had characteristics of cleavage fragments. And uh, they argued that cleavage fragments are technically not asbestos, and therefore we could not regulate them. So this was this was problematic for us. We uh, we knew that whether they were cleavage fragments or asbestos, this was the material that was causing health problems in and and deaths in Libby. And so it became uh, an interesting and protracted argument that in fact continues today. In order to prove our case, we, we um, felt that we had to measure uh, health effects in the population. So as part of our investigation, we built uh, 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 a medical facility, a radiological testing facility, and we, uh, we recommended to the entire population of Libby that they be screened through this radiology uh, unit. This is basically a triple wide trailer that you're looking at that we built in Libby in order to affect a large epidemiological study there by screening, voluntarily screening the participants. We did get 7,000 uh, individuals, both uh, present uh, residents of Libby and those who had moved out of town to join us. This is Dr. Brad Black. He was the public health physician at the time, and here he is inside the clinic and uh, showing you a radiograph of, of lungs of a, one, of the, one of the residents of Libby. So this is the type of uh, disease that we were seeing in the population. So the two panels on the left are uh, uh, um, microscope slides taken at autopsy. Uh, and you can see, if you, if you look closely, you see the, the uh, mineral fiber, the elongate mineral particle, surrounded by cells that we'll, we'll see in a minute are macrophage cells. And both of, those, um, both of those slides on the left are microscope slides, light microscope slides, showing what are called um, mineral bodies or ferruginous bodies. They're called ferruginous bodies because they collect uh, iron-based stain uh, when they're stained. On the right, you can see this individual with um, with pleural plaques, bilateral uh, um, uh, uh, pleural plaques in, in their lung. Those plaques at autopsy, what we're looking at at the lower right are um, uh, the, the plaques on the lower, on the, on the diaphragmatic side of, of the lungs of an individual who passed away from uh, exposure in, in Libby, Montana. Again, here are, the, here are the types of disease that we're seeing. This is a, a um, high-resolution CAT scan uh, showing 
this unusual type of disease that we saw in Livy, uh, pleural thickening. And I say it was unusual, it's, pleural thickening is not uncommon, but the aggressiveness of this particular disease was striking. And those little spots where the arrows point are form, uh, uh, plaques beginning to form on this individual's lung, they will grow rapidly and, and ultimately encase this individual's lung in such a way that they can no longer breathe. Uh, there are some enhanced uh, tools to look at this type of disease. This individual happens to have been exposed to elongate mineral particles, a very similar problem to what we saw in Libby. But the, in this case, these are uh, uh, folks exposed to elongate mineral par particles associated with uh, taconite dust. Taconite is a, is a very low grade of iron ore that's mined in the upper part of Minnesota and Michigan. So the, the, the lung diseases that we were seeing and um, are still seeing that are uh, 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 related to exposure to elongate mineral particles are pleural effusions, pleural plaques and diffuse pleural thickening, pulmonary fibrosis, malignant mesothelioma, which is a classic disease, very deadly cancer associated with exposure to asbestos, and all kinds of bronchiogenic carcinoma. So, um, uh, these were, we saw these diseases, all these diseases in Libby and be, began uh, arguing that in fact, that there was, there was a problem here with exposure to these uh, uh, related, asbestos related elongate mineral particles, regardless of what the uh, industry had been telling us. So, um, the Department of Justice agreed with us. So on February 7, 2005, years after we were uh, involved in the Libby case and had won uh, so, uh, a large civil suit against the, um, the industry, they, the Department of Justice filed criminal charges. So the several of the senior individuals associated with the industry, W.R. Grace, were charged with fraud, obstruction of justice, and, and knowing endangerment in, in Libby. So this, um, uh, this really um, was the culmination of a lot of uh, work done by the emergency response group. But I want to talk now about the, um, uh, you know, what are, what are these things and what is the mechanism by which these elongate mineral particles are um, causing disease? And, and right now, the regulations are based upon characteristics that were very useful years and years ago, decades ago, when light micros microscopes were the main tool used for protecting people from asbestos. That's no longer the case anymore. We t typically use scanning electron microscopes. Uh, microscopes and transmission electron microscopes for characterizing asbestos. So I want to take you on uh, a, a little trip into the lung to see what is, what is it, how do these things cause disease, and what are some of the arguments that are going on right now in, in as we continue to um, uh, try to protect the uh, public health from exposure to elongate mineral particles. Uh, so let's just take a little trip into the lung here. You can see that um, one of the things about uh, these mineral particles are that they can uh, uh, they align with the laminar flow as we inhale, and they can make their way very, very deep into the lungs as uh, as we breathe. Uh, so we're going to go. We're going to go. We're going to dive deeply into the lung now. So this is uh, these are the alveoli of the lung where gas exchange takes place, and you you can see that as as we know there are uh, venules and arterioles that course throughout this lower part of the lung. That there's also lymphatic tissue, where the, uh, particles, small particles, uh, spherical particles that make their way all the way to this part of the lung, can be. Uh, removed and excreted in the urine. So let's go into one of these alveolar sacs and take a look at what they, what they, what they are. Um, this is a scanning electron microscope of, of those grape-like structures, the alveolar, uh, um, the alveolar uh, sacs that where air exchange takes place. 
Uh, this is a cartoon of one of those sacks, and I just want to point out here a couple of things. The um, the alveolar capillary membrane is just 0.2 microns thick, so really, we're this is this is uh, there's almost nothing between uh, our blood our bloodstream in the lung and these uh, uh, and and the air that comes into these alveolar sacs. The other thing I want to point out in the lower right is the alveolar macrophage, and I want to talk to you a little bit about that and the role that it plays in this type of disease. Um, so this is a scanning electron micro, micrograph of an alveolar macrophage, and this is one of the things I love about biology because it's just fascinating what these, these cells do. There are trillions of them throughout our body and, and, um, and of course, throughout the lung where they, where they scavenge, they move, they uh, have an amoeba-like movement, they move throughout the, uh, the lung, they identify using these pseudopods, the strings that look like they're coming out of that cell are actually pseudopods. And if you look closely, you can see little sensory uh, uh, end, ends on those pseudopods. In this case, the macrophage is uh, looking for and identifying bacteria. It will take those bacteria into itself and digest those using um, uh, various types of lysosomal activities. And these cells also identify aging uh, red blood cells, which you see a red blood cell up, up to the right, and the macrophage is, is uh, uh, identifying that as a potential, um, uh, if, if, if that blood cell is aberrant in any way or it's aging, that it will be recycled, that the components of it will be saved and other parts excreted in the urine. So what happens if we look at the left-hand side of this is the macrophage, uh, and, and this is a, obviously a cartoon of a mac, uh, macrophage, you see the elongate mineral, mineral particles in the upper left. Uh, they're being invaginated and taken into the uh, macrophage cell where they activate uh, a number of uh, systems, cell signaling systems, and the release of cytokines that are associated with inflammation. So this is you know, a complex system that we won't go into any great detail on now, but collectively this process is referred to as the inflammasome. And, and so this macrophage, the inflammasome is being activated by these elongate mineral particles, and it's excreting an interleukin, a type of cytokine, interleukin-1 beta. So one of the things that we have done at NIH is look, because we have the ability now using nanotechnology to, to manufacture uh, 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 elongate mineral particles of various sizes and, and shapes and, and, um, and makeup. And what, we're, what we were interested here in this experiment is looking at the relationship between the aspect ratio, which is AR, over in the graph on the right, AR is, it, it, so these, these particles are very uniform. They all have an aspect ratio of six to one. And then at the bottom of the graph, you see uh, uh, an, a lesser aspect ratio. The message being here that the, large, the, the larger the aspect ratio, the greater that the uh, inflammasome is activated. And what's interesting about this experiment is up in the right, you can see that particles even less than two microns in length cause this type of inflammasome activation. And we think that's very, very important um, with respect to the present uh, definitions of regulatory asbestos. So, so this is another picture of a macrophage, and the, in this case, the macrophage has uh, tried to engulf elongate mineral particles, and it's become frustrated with that process. So it is, it is creating uh, a, um, a, cytochrome, a cytochrome storm, if you will. And um, uh, so uh, it, it, the next step in this process would be for this macrophage to recruit other macrophages and begin scarring off these, these elongate mineral particles. So uh, that is really what is the initiation of the plaque formation formation that I showed you on the previous slide. Again, um, 
these uh, these particles break down. They break down in the environment. These these bundle these bundles of fibers break down in the environment. They also, interestingly, and this is work done by Dr. Phil Cook at EPA's laboratory in Duluth, uh, Duluth, Minnesota. What Phil Cook did was he dosed animals with um, with bundles of uh, various types of asbestos and monitored them uh, over the course of, of two years. So uh, what we see here is that on the, on the y-axis, the number of uh, elongate mineral particles actually went up in the lung over the course of those two years. So he gave one dose and that dose actually grew of course across the course of those two years. So we think this has a lot to do with why asbestos has a, has a latency period of, of years in some cases, because bundles are splitting into smaller and smaller uh, sizes, and uh, they're continuing to cause this uh, inflama inflammatory reaction in the lung. Presently, um, and this, this is a graph, uh, cumulative frequency distribution of the sizes of particles that we collected in Libby, Montana. And what we knew after the early stages of our investigation was that uh, most of the particles that we were seeing were less than five microns. The red line through this graph indicates EPA's regulatory limit. So EPA regulates everything to the right, but does, but does not regulate anything to the left based upon the length of the elongate mineral particle. We think this is problematic because uh, uh, as I showed you on the, on the pre, uh, couple of slides back, even fibers as short as two microns can activate the inflammasome. So that brings us, um, let's see how our time's doing here. That brings us close to the, to the end of my presentation, but I wanted to remind you that in fact, these arguments are raging right now. I know we're all busy, of course, with the, the uh, coronavirus issues and COVID-19, uh, but as, as, we, as we deal with this, the discussions and, uh, and, and debates uh, and science regarding exposure to these elongate mineral particles is raging, largely in part uh, due to uh, exposure to cosmetic products that have these so-called unregulated particles in them. Uh, and uh, as you can see, baby powder is is highlighted here. Baby Johnson Johnson baby powder is not the only product that where that's problematic, but uh, it's probably one of the most controversial right now. So let's see here. Uh, So um, within the last several months, FDA has become interested in this, in, in this uh, issue as well. And these graphs are public now, so I can show, show you them. But what, what we see here is the same phenomena where in fact, most of the particles, these taken from various cosmetic products very recently have these <clears throat> elongate mineral particles that are shorter than the regulated limit. Again, the regulated uh, limit is five microns. If you look at the X axis, most of the particles in, in these samples that are being pulled are shorter than the regulatory limit. Yet we know from uh, history and from toxicology and from the information that I just showed you that these that these uh, short particles can indeed cause uh, disease and, and death. So we're, we're, we're debating that right now in the, in the forensic and um, toxicological arenas. This, this study um, was done by NIOSH a few years ago and, it's, and it, it, it highlights the same concept. So what was done here is uh, Dr. Les Stainer went back to old uh, epidemiological studies and pulled the light microscopic slides 
from many studies and measured them using an electron microscope. His objective here is to look and see what the relationship between the shorter particles and the regulated particles were. And you can read his conclusions here, but what you see, and again, this red line depicts um, everything that is in fact regulated, all of that being you know, toward you, toward the viewer. So the, the, um, the white topped bars are regulated but again most of the material in these uh in these studies in these epidemiological studies that had been originally um, measured with light microscopy when they were looked at with electron microscopy they dominated the exposure and um this is this is this is a problem so um i think that might be my last slide yeah there it is so I'm happy to answer any questions or, or try to do that if I can. And thank you, Dr. Weiss, for that outstanding presentation. And we will now move to the Q&A portion of this presentation. As a reminder, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. And any um, questions we cannot answer uh, today, we will answer them via email. So let's take a look at our questions coming in from our audience members. And we have time for just a few today. Um, our first question, Dr. Weiss, <clears throat> is what was the primary symptoms that appeared in the exposure? So um, what, what we saw in, in Libby, Montana, was we, we knew there were cases of lung cancer and mesothelioma. But far and away, most of the disease that we saw were plural, plural plaques, plural, plural plaquing. And um, when we engaged the industry on this topic, and, and we knew that this plural plaquing would progress to lethal disease if it was allowed to, to proceed, and, and there's really no treatment for it. So once the plaquing initi was initiated, it, it typically continued to a debilitating or lethal uh, disease. Um, uh, you know, what, what we saw was far and away, most of this material, uh, most of the disease was related to this pleural plaquing and not uh, mesothelioma or, or lung cancer. Thank you for that. And were they aware that the dust in the air was um, asbestos at the time? There was discussion about that, but uh, the industry, you know, as you saw from the video, the industry dominated the the town. They owned, they they donated all the money to the the high school to to keep the school going. Interestingly, they had spread vermiculite, contaminated vermiculite, all over the track, and the the track coach died of mesothelioma. Uh, they uh, supported the churches. They said so they they for all practical purposes, owned the hospital. Uh, uh, there, were, there was some evidence that they, they had such dominant, dominant influence over the hospital that diagnoses were changed and that sort of thing. Uh, but um, uh, th there, the, the, um, the, the, the town was essentially owned by uh, the, the industry. And so there were rumors of asbestos being present, but they had effectively convinced not just the population, but the regulatory authorities that this was not asbestos, that it was cleavage fragments and, uh, and, the, and they fell outside of the regulatory range. Thank you for that. And what is the difference between asbestos and cleavage product? Uh, well, that's the debate that's going on right now. Uh, in in uh, I'm not a mineralogist, but asbestos. Uh, my my understanding is that asbestos is uh, born uh, of of a uh, of a process, uh, a geologic process that pulls the rock somewhat like taffy. It, uh, it, it stretches the rock. It becomes very high in, in tensile strength, etc. Et Cleavage fragments, by contrast, 
are chips or crystals that break off of larger pieces of rock that are of the same mineral nature. So if you have, let's say you have a rock of tremolite, you can have tremolite that is in fact grown, geologically grown you know, over millions of years as, as an asbestos form type, but you can also uh, have weaknesses in the crystal structure that cause long, thin, elongate mineral particles, and that's why I use that term, to, um, to form. And, and the, the argument between industry and the regulators right now is that cleavage fragments are not true asbestos, and therefore they cannot be regulated. And that's the case still in our country. And that's why um, uh, products, uh, you know, s such as those that I, that I showed are still allowed on the market, despite the fact that we know they're causing disease. We know how the disease is caused um, by this inflammatory reaction, etc. cetera. It's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting forensic problem. Uh, interesting to me because I've been working on it for more than 20 years and I'm still working on it. It's still an argument in the, in the, uh, in the regulatory arena. We have time for one more question, and here's an interesting one. Does, pay, does baby powder contain these elongated mineral products? Yes. <laughs> Short and sweet, huh? <laughs> thank you, Dr. White. And thank you for this outstanding presentation once again and for your important research. Do you have any closing remarks for our audience as we close today? No, I. I but I would like to just thank uh, – um, the lab lab roots, and especially uh, thanks to to Tyler uh, and Lynn and Susie you for for guiding me through this. I apologize for the little glitch that we had there. Uh, this uh, virtual world is new to all of us, so I'm I'm going to take a pass on that. <laughs> and thanks to everyone who joined joined today. I hope you you um, I hope it was instructive and interesting to you. And I'm glad to try and answer any questions if I can. Uh, and thank, email. And thank, yes, definitely. And thank you again, Dr. Weiss, um, for your presentation. And as a final reminder to our audience members, any questions that were submitted that were not answered today will be answered via email by Dr. Weiss. This presentation will be available for on-demand viewing until November 2020. So please share it with your colleagues who may have missed today's topic. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, take care and stay healthy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.